So today I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. John Stutz. Dr. Stutz received his Bachelor of Science degree from Purdue University and his medical degree from the University of Louisville School of Medicine. He then completed his pediatric residency and fellowship in gastroenterology and a master's in public health at Vanderbilt University. He then returned to Louisville to join the U of L faculty in the Department of Pediatrics in 2000. He serves as the Associate Director for Gastroenterology Core Curriculum and Residency Medical Education for the Department of Pediatrics. And he is a member of the Professional Development Committee for the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, and has previously served as a member of both their public education and professional education committees. So we would like to welcome Dr. Stutz today who will be discussing practical applications of nutrition in, in patients with food allergies. So take it away, Dr. Stutz. Okay, let me pull up these slides. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I'm happy to be with each of you today. The only thing that would be better is if I was with you today, physically, face to face. We've really had to adjust how we're learning and, and educating um, in the world of COVID and that's okay. We certainly are adapting to that and, and um, kudos to you for joining in and um, being a part of this. So I'm happy to be with you. Um, there we go. So uh, I have received honorarium in the past as a speaker for Abbott Nutrition. That is certainly not going to impact our discussion today. All right. So we're going to talk about a topic that is, it's so common. I know it's common in your practices. Families come in on a regular basis and say, do you think this could be an allergy? And I just had a patient this morning in clinic that said, do you think this could be an allergy? And they took it even further and said, do you, even, do you think this could be an eosinophilic enteropathy in my child? They had been on the World Wide Web doing some research. And so although it's a common question for me and for you, I know it is the public doesn't have a great understanding of allergy and, and how to assess for that and whether that is a component in what's going on clinically with their child. And to be honest, if we're really being transparent, healthcare providers don't have a really great full understanding of allergy and how that can impact um, a child's clinical presentation. But what we're gonna do today, one, we're gonna probably go over some things that you know. And then we're gonna go over some things that you don't know, and that's part of the learning process, and that's great. But what my hope is, is that I'm presenting this to you in a way that there's not a lot to memorize. If we're memorizing, then it's difficult to remember everything. So I'm presenting this in a way that I think you're gonna find is real palatable, and that is nothing to memorize, and that's gonna help, I hope, you in the process of, of, um, of continuing to apply this uh, as, as this afternoon, tomorrow, the next day. Um, so let's get right to it. So adverse food reactions. Let's talk about that first because this, this, is, a, this is a broad term and it, it is a generic term that is defined as any abnormal clinical response associated with the ingestion of or exposure to a food or food additive. And up to 25% 25% folks of the US population report a symptom related to food. The, but, but the majority of those cannot be confirmed. Okay, so events where food relation can be confirmed can be classified as either one, food intolerance, or two, food allergy. So let's delve into that a little bit more. So we've got our adverse food reaction at the top, that's our umbrella term. We're breaking down in the left into food intolerance and then on the right into food allergy. Let's start with food intolerance. So a food intolerance can be due to a food characteristic or it can be due to a host characteristic. So my buddy, John, he'll always say, he's funny, 
he always says things like, I love onions, but they don't love me. And, and it's not a problem with the onion. It's a problem with the host, my buddy John. You know, when he realizes that, so he avoids them because he has a, an intolerance to them. But that's not a food allergy. So when we talk about on the right-hand side of food allergy, this is really important, guys. You can have IgE-mediated food allergy. You can have non-IgE-mediated food allergy. Or you can have a mixture of IgE and non-IgE going on in the same patient. So let's make sure everyone is on the same page because we have a wide variety of individuals in the audience today. So when we think about IgE mediated, most of us and certainly the lay public, they think about allergy being, it's the IgE version. I get exposed and I swell up and lose my airway. I get exposed and I develop highs. I start to have respiratory problems. My lips swell, very, very rapid. You get exposed and then you have symptoms quickly. That's IgE mediated. That's on one side of the coin. On the other side, the non-IgE mediated, the lay public does not understand this. And most or many healthcare providers, they don't understand this concept either. So remember, as opposed to IgE mediated, non-IgE mediated is a delayed hypersensitivity. The symptoms do not start after the exposure for usually greater than an hour, and it can be two, three, four hours after that exposure versus IgE mediated is within an hour. Non-IgE mediated can also, because it's a delayed hypersensitivity, it can take days, weeks, months before that patient finally has a clinical manifestation. So we're gonna get into that and, 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 and some, of the, some of the manifestations that we see, but just realize, IgE mediated, it's immediate, but a lot of what we're talking about today is non-IgE mediated, and we're going to get into, well, can you just go get allergy tested for that? Can't you just go get allergy tested for it all? And the answer is no, you can't. You're going to understand why by the time we finish. Okay, so let's get into cow's milk protein allergy specifically, because this is so, so common. So what is cow's milk protein allergy? It is the most common food allergy present in up to two and a half to three percent of otherwise normal infants within the first year of life. Now guys, 2.5 percent of otherwise normal infants within the first year of life. How many babies were born in Louisville, Kentucky in the past week? How many babies were born in the state of Kentucky in the last month? How many babies were born in the United States or are less than one year of age in the United States in a given year? So we are talking about hundreds of thousands of infants who have cow's milk protein allergy that are coming to your and my office. This is common. These patients, you see them, you're taking care of them almost every day. This is a lot of babies and otherwise they're doing well. So remember, we've already covered a bit about this idea of IgE mediated versus non-IgE mediated. Remember, IgE mediated, several systems are involved. It's really just one isolated gut, a gut syndrome when you're talking about that rapid IgE mediated allergy. And, um, but you can see IgE mediation in an infant that has an atopic dermatitis like eczema. Okay, you switch over and think more toward that delayed hypersensitivity, that non-IgE mediated, it is more common in the first part of the first year of life. The symptoms usually affect the gut only. Allergic proctocolitis, which we're gonna go over, which is that, um, other, that, that manifestation that you see in the office of an otherwise healthy infant with normal baby poops with blood and or mucus streaks in it, that's the allergic proctocolitis. As the name implies, that, that area, that ana anatomical area that's being affected is the colon. It's the, it's the rectum. And so that's the reason you see that blood as a result of inflammation caused by that allergic process. And food, food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, or FPIES, okay, that's a newer 
allergic manifestation in terms of the grand history of medicine. That's a newer, new, more newly recognized diagnosis. We don't know as much about that, but it is also an example of non-IgE mediated. Remember, you're not gonna just send a patient to the allergist to be tested for non-IgE mediated allergens. And so we've gotta keep these, we've gotta keep these diagnoses and these manifestations that are affecting the GI tract in our wheelhouse to make the diagnosis. It's not something that can, we can just go order a test for or refer to that allergy specialist to diagnose. All right, so how does cow's milk protein allergy manifest? Well, in the gastrointestinal world, in my world, gastrointestinally, it is, it, it's common um, 50 to 60% of the time, it's blood and mucus in the stool, as I, as I just um, discussed. Patients can have abdominal pain. They may see iron deficiency anemia if there is an extensive involvement of not only, um, of, of probably more the upper GI tract, not just the colon or not just the rectum. Um, the same would hold true for hypoalbuminemia. You're probably gonna be having some more upper GI symptoms um, in the, uh, our system involved of the small intestine. And, and again, you're probably gonna have small intestinal involvement if, the, if you've got a component of failure to thrive due to cow's milk protein allergy. The skin, just as common as GI. Um, atopic dermatitis and urticaria. You know, it's, I have had many patients that come into my practice for whatever GI issue, and I'm looking at this infant with horrible eczema, and I'll say, tell me about this eczema. What are you doing for the eczema? And they're doing all of the right things, but but I, it just hasn't been thought about a cow's milk protein allergy. So I will make an intervention to treat cow's milk protein allergy, which we're going to go over in a few minutes. And when I come to see them, they come back to see me, they've had a big improvement in their skin, even though that's not why they came to see me as a gastroenterologist in the first place. So it's incredibly common. And then over, you see on the right-hand side in the respiratory tract, less frequent, which is good, because the manifestations here are acute laryngoedema, obstruction with difficulty breathing and anaphylaxis. So you begin to see here, when you look at the spectrum of symptoms, you can see there are symptoms, especially over there when you're looking at that re those respiratory tract symptoms, they seem very rapid, IgE mediated. And that can be a component of cow's milk protein allergy. But then when you look over on the GI side, that's more of that non-IgE mediated its exposure to that allergen over time leads to inflammation, which leads to that clinical manifestation and those lab findings potentially. So we, when we talk about this diagnosis, it's not so easy to just, it's just not as typical as what the lay public and most of us typically think about with allergy. We're talking about assuming that there is a non-IgE component involved. All right, let's keep going. So what tests should I consider for cow's milk protein allergy? Do I need to do testing on these child? Well, generally, tests are not needed. So this first bullet is really, really where I live most of the time. I'm not getting testing on these children that walk in. You could get a right stain um, that may show positive neutrophils and possibly some eosinophils, but eosinophilia, it, it is, it is nonspecific, and it's not going to really give you any answers. And the mom I was referring to this morning, the pediatrician had gotten a CBC with differential. She saw the high eosinophils. And so she started um, Googling and looking for eosinophils. And that's what took her down the path of eosinophilic enteritis and started raising those questions with me. You've got those moms and dads in your practice that are out there doing it. But honestly, I don't think this child had that. But just remember, eosinophilia, and as I explained to her and educated her this morning, that, that's very nonspecific. So you're probably not going to learn a great deal from that right stain when you're talking about cow's milk protein allergy. Should we get a stool culture? Well, um, staph and enteric pathogens, they, they could cause blood in the stool, yes. Um, C. diff could as well, but let me just say, do not obtain a stool C. diff on any child less than one year of age because so many of them are going to come back with a positive. They're often carriers at that age. It's going to come back positive. And then literally you have opened a Pandora's box that you will probably never get that lid shut on again. So yes, C. diff can cause blood in the stool, but unless they have diarrhea, 
um, bleeding and other pronounced symptoms in an older child, I would not get that. And I would not get that in a child less than one year of age. Okay, what about blood tests? A CBC, which may reveal an anemia, but if so, is that physiologic? Are they at their physiologic nadir on that? I already discussed the peripheral eosinophilia. Um, do you need to get a co coags? Well, remember, I've said several times, these children generally are otherwise healthy. If you've got a child who has um, bleeding in their stool due to a coagulopathy, they're probably not going to look that good. You're probably gonna be seeing or getting a history of easy bruising or petechiae or um, other, other clinical um, clues that, that they've got a coagulation issue. So I'm not generally getting coags on these patients. And then plain radiographs of the abdomen, you could get that. Um, certainly you might get that if you had a premature infant where you were thinking about maybe pneumatosis intestinalis, NEC or something like that. But again, that NEC child is probably not gonna be in your office looking good. Um, so it's pretty rare for me to get um, a radiograph if I'm suspecting cow's milk protein allergy in a baby who's having normal stools with blood and mucus mixed with that normal appearing stool. So the bottom line is the first bullet, generally, tests are not needed in these infants. So what's the treatment? Well, dietary change is the key, all right? If if, if the symptoms that the child is having is due to exposure to a protein in their diet that um, is causing that inflammation and causing those manifestations, we have to remove that allergen from their diet. All right, so what about the treatment of the breastfed infant? Okay, I would be a fool to tell you that I want any breastfeeding child to come off of breast milk. I don't, I want all of our infants to be on breast milk, absolutely. But the reality is that um, at some point, many moms choose to transition to formula or, um, or, or choose to, to, to not breastfeed. But when we're talking about that breastfed infant, we want that baby to stay on the breast. So what that requires is a dietary change from the mom, that source of nutrition for that infant. So mom must eliminate all dairy, and I'm also going to say and soy from her diet. Now, when we talk about eliminating all dairy and soy from their diet, this is not, I'm gonna cut back on my, on, my, on my cheese. I'm gonna cut back on my ice cream. This is strict elimination, guys. We're treating an allergy. So what I say to mom is I, I say, if you were allergic to bee stings, would a little bee sting be okay? And then they immediately are like, no. So that example, even though that's more, more IgE mediated, it really gives them the sense of, okay, this is an allergic process and I can't cheat on this diet and I can't, I can't just cut back on those allergens. I need to eliminate them. So that bee sting idea really makes it real and it clears up any, any gray zone for them about the need to very strictly eliminate dairy and soy. So if we're eliminating that from a mom's diet, man, their eyes get really big because that's a challenge. That would be really challenging for you and for me. But what I very quickly do is I begin cheerleading because I want that mom to continue breastfeeding. So I begin talking about all the foods they can have and how to prepare those meals. And I also utilize our dietitian. After I've done that, I have our dietitian meet with that mom because if we're eliminating dairy and soy from their diet, from that mom's diet, well, you're really eliminating and you're potentially eliminating vitamin D, calcium, other, you know, you're, you're limiting macro and micronutrients that we don't want that mom to get deficient on. So what I, what I talk about is doing fresh meats, fresh vegetables and fresh fruits, but really the most important words on this slide are fresh, fresh and fresh because invariably when we go to the grocery and we buy items at the market that are prepackaged, and you read the fine print, invariably there is milk and or soy in that ingredient list. So it does require the investment on the family's part to buy fresh meat and produce and prepare them without adding dairy and soy to the mix. But I've gotta be honest guys, I don't, if, if I've done, my due diligence to 
um, empower these moms to continue breastfeeding. It is very, I almost never have a mom that stops breastfeeding because of this diagnosis in their child. They're usually invested in breastfeeding and they will do it. But again, we want to make sure that they're getting all of those macro and micronutrients that they need. So they're healthy as they continue this elimination diet for the treatment of their child. Okay, so what if they are on formula? They're not fortunate enough to be on breast milk. Okay, we've got the option of casein hydrolysate formulas, and we've got the option of elemental amino acid-based formulas. All right, these are both categories of formulas that are hypoallergenic. Okay, remember, the term hypoallergenic, that is not a marketing term that's used on a label for a formula. They have to show, formula companies have to show that their formula is hypoallergenic and meets very, very strict criteria to be able to utilize that word in, um, in their labeling. So if we're gonna treat um, an infant with an allergy, we need to be on a hypoallergenic formula. And these are the two categories um, that we would utilize. Okay, some examples of casein hydrolysate formulas. We've got Alimentum from Abbott Nutrition. We've got Nutramagen from Mead Johnson. We've got Pregestamil from Mead Johnson. Um, Pregestamil doesn't really carry much of the weight in the marketplace as much as it used to. I think, I think um, those of you are more familiar probably with Nutramagen, at least in the state of Kentucky and in our region. And then um, extensive HA, the HA stands for hypoallergenic, that's available from Gerber. So there are hosts, re regardless of the, of the company that's making that formula, generally they will have a hypoallergenic casein hydrolysate formula that is available. Now there are, there are little distinctions between, between these different formulas um, that you've got to make the decision of which one you want to utilize in your patients. Um, but all of these would meet the criteria as being a casein hydrolysate formula that is hypoallergenic. And that's what we want to be, we, that's what we want to use on these infants that have cow's milk protein, soy protein um, uh, allergy. Okay, what about elemental or amino acid based formulas? Okay, um, we've got Elecare from Abbott Nutrition, we've got Neocate from SHS, we've got Pure Amino from Mead Johnson, we've got Alpha Amino um, Infant from Nestle. So again, just like um, with our casein hydrolysate formulas, we've got a host of different um, uh, formula companies that are making their amino acid blend um, that is considered hypoallergenic. And you as a healthcare provider have to decide which of those um, you wanna use, which you feel is the best product um, for your patients, um, but realize that you have this as a hypoallergenic, um, hypoallergenic option. What I would say in these infants, I am probably going to use a casein hydrolysate formula first, All right? I'm going to go to that level of product first. And if they have improved but continued symptoms for four to six weeks after using that casein hydrolysate, maybe their um, rectal bleeding has stopped, but they come back in four to six weeks and they're still heme positive, that's when I would go on to an amino acid-based formula. The reason for that is one, economics. Um, the, both the casein hydrolysate and our amino acid-based formulas, they are more expensive than a whole protein formula, yes, but, um, but the casein hydrolysates are a bit less expensive than in the amino acid-based formula. These are more expensive because they cost these companies more to produce them. There is a much strin more stringent process that these companies have to go, to go through to produce them and hence the increase in cost. They're a godsend. Um, we didn't have these years ago. And so we definitely, uh, they have value and they're worth it. But um, realize that from an economic standpoint, I would go to the casein hydrolysate formula as a treatment for um, cow's milk protein allergy first before going to the amino acid based formula level. Okay, so what about rectal bleeding in the premature infant, that NICU baby? Okay, just realize they can develop cow's milk protein allergy as well. You may, you, you may not be in the neonatology unit, but I, I've been consulted to, to the NICU before um, where they've got bleeding in an infant and realizing, think back to the statistics that I told you, 2.5 to 3% of babies less than one year of age in the United States will have a manifestation of cow's milk protein allergy. 
premature infants can have calcium protein allergy manifestations as well. Certainly in the NICU, um, they're going to be thinking about a host of diagnoses that can be really, really serious. Um, the differential for these NICU babies, swallow maternal blood, necrotizing enterocolitis, infectious colitis, first Sprung's disease with an enterocolitis, duplication cyst, meaning duplication of the GI tract. If you duplicate the GI tract in a place it's not supposed to be, it is going to be more prone to bleed. Vascular malformations, hemophilia, maternal ITP, maternal NSAID use, all of these are on the differential. But keep in mind in those premature infants, or maybe you've inherited a baby that was in the NICU for a few days and that was doing well and came out to you as a, as a primary care physician, and then all of a sudden you've got blood in the stool, okay, dietary protein intolerance and allergy, it is absolutely still on the differential while you think about these other things, making sure that they are not present, all right? Common is common. And dietary protein intolerance, allergy common in not only term, but also in preterm infants. Okay, so what's the natural history and when can regular formula be reintroduced? Well, most babies have outgrown cow's milk protein, soy protein allergy by nine months of age. Okay, but 22% can still be intolerant at age six years. That's not the GI patients. That's not the GI manifestations, guys. That's more the skin and those um, cardiopulmonary um, manifestations that can be intolerant later. I had, I'll tell you a story. I had to become a pediatric gastroenterologist to diagnose my childhood. I was a child with rip roaring eczema as a baby and as a child, young child. To, I, I would claw myself to the point of bleeding and my mother was doing all the right things. I was lathered up. I was oiled up. I was, I was, I was slicker than a, a, a greased pig. I'm not kidding. And, and she talked to my pediatrician about it. And my pediatrician said, he's going to outgrow it. And I don't know if anyone is in the audience that may remember Dr. Dr. Pipkin, Dr. Fred Pipkin. He was my pediatrician here in Louisville. He was a mainstay in the pediatric community here for years and years, but he, you know, it wasn't part of his training, IgE mediated, non-IgE mediated, not uh, mixed mediation. That wasn't part of the curriculum back in his day. And it wasn't when I was, when I was an infant, I got enough silver in this hairline that wasn't on the table back then, but he had a keen sense of observation and it was old school. He did my exam in the newborn nursery. And then he is the only pediatrician that saw me until I went away to college. And that's the way his practice was. So he saw these infants with eczema and he saw over their childhood that that eczema would go away um, and unfortunately we didn't have the knowledge back then that this was a cow's milk protein allergy and that there needed to be elimination in the diet and so i suffered through it but it took me until about age 10 or 11 for my eczema to resolve so i was in that 22 percent that could still be intolerant at age six and beyond, but that wasn't, I didn't have GI manifestations. And I, and I don't think that you will see that very often. I think I'm gonna be taking care of that patient that still has GI manifestations of, of allergy at that kind of age. So most resolve at nine months of age. So I allow that breastfeeding mom to have dairy and soy back in her diet, or if it's a formula fed infant, I'm gonna let them go back to regular formula at nine months of age. That's what most of the literature supports. Now, um, even though I give that green light to moms and dads on that, something for them is more magical about 12 months of age. They're just hesitant to do it. They're scared of going back to those symptoms that they saw in their infant at a younger age. And so they're a bit hesitant, but, um, but I give them the green light at nine months of age. What I will say to them though, is we're gonna do this at nine months of age. And if the symptoms come back, then that is simply your baby's way of saying they have not outgrown their allergy yet. And we'll wait a couple of months before rechallenging. Now, it took me less than 30 seconds to say that, but that anticipatory guidance will save a lot of anxiety on the part of that parent. And it will save a lot of phone calls that are associated with that anxiety to your office if you simply tell them that that could happen. 
And, and so if it happens, they'll say, yep, the doctor said that could happen. And they told me to go back to what was working for a couple of months before we rechallenged. That it, it will, it, it is what you need is one of the things you absolutely need to um, give in terms of anticipatory guidance. So a couple of other things in terms of anticipatory guidance, is this lactose intolerance? No, it's not. This is not an intolerance. This is an allergy. This is on the other side of that algorithm that we looked at that was under the adverse food reactions. If you don't tell families this, you can do a great job educating them on this, but they will walk out of your office, get on their cell phone, call their mother-in-law and say, yep, it was the lactose intolerance. We knew it all the time. That's exactly what we said it was going to be because the lay public knows the terminology lactose intolerance. You've got to tell them specifically, this is not lactose intolerance. This is an allergy, all right? And that's going to save a lot of confusion as well. And it's going to make them realize this isn't just backing off on things that contain lactose. This is strict elimination of dairy and soy, all right? And is this a lifelong allergy? Another really important anticipatory guidance. No, it is not a lifelong allergy. We live in a time where allergen, allergens and allergy are a focus not only because parents are on the internet, as we discussed earlier, but it's a focus in school, they, schools, um, cafeterias, daycares. It, it's become really strict, hasn't it? And so you've got to tell these families that this is not a lifelong allergy or this child may be labeled for a lifetime with an allergy that they don't have. And there's way too much good dairy and soy in the world to be ingested in their lifetime to assume this, uh, to assume a lifelong label that's incorrect. We don't really know science. We as medicine don't know why they outgrow this allergy. And we don't really, we don't really think of allergies being outgrown, do we? That's the reason sometimes you'll see um, from an academic standpoint, folks get real um, nitpicky for lack of better terms on not calling this a cow's milk soy protein allergy, but a cow's milk protein intolerance. Um, but, but it is an allergic process. And so that's what I refer to, but we don't know why it's outgrown. The theory is, the hypothesis is that the T cell amplification that happens naturally in that infant's immune system in the first year of life gives their immune system more intelligence, if you will, to not recognize those proteins as something that they need to fight and create an inflammatory reaction against. So it's, it's part of that um, first year of life, that, that um, develop, development of the immune system and the development of the intelligence of the immune system. That is the theory of why that, that disappears typically by nine months of age in these infants. Okay. So is cow's milk soy protein allergy, is that eosinophilic esophagitis? Is that the same thing? Okay, it's not. That's a, that's a different allergic process going on in the GI tract. So let's talk about that a bit, okay? Um, I've already talked about the soy-based formula. I, I, I will say before we get into EOE, why is soy on the list? Well, if a child has cow's milk protein allergy that's IgE mediated, remember we said it can have an IgE component, then they're probably going to do fine with soy. But if the cow's milk protein is non-IgE mediated, soy protein is frequently not tolerated and in the infant GI syndromes greater than 50% are going to react to soy in most, most science that's out there, studies that are out there. So you can't go get tested for non-IgE mediated. And if they've got GI component, I want you to assume they have a non-IgE component to this. And so that's the reason a soy-based formula is not going to be the right answer on your board exams, on the board renewals, or in the real world. I started talking about this um, topic. I'll tell you how that happened. And this slide, parts of this slide set uh, are are still a result of me giving a board review course to our third year residents. And what I was doing was going through old questions from the boards 
that uh, and and they the residents in the audience had their clickers where they could answer A, B, C, or D, or E, and and it was a beautiful vignette on cow's milk protein allergy, and I'm thinking this is easy, and the question was what dietary change would you make in this formula fed infant, and they got to click in their answers, and all but one third year resident got it wrong because they answered soy based formula, and the correct answer was an extensively hydrolyzed formula or casein hydrolysate formula, which is extensively hydrolyzed. So that's the right answer because you're not gonna know whether there's a non-IGE component and if it's a, and we've got to assume that it does have a non-IGE component. And if it does, they're probably gonna to react to soy. So that's the reason not only do I eliminate cow's milk protein, but soy protein as we've discussed thus far today. Okay, that's why. And that's the reason it's the right, the right answer in the real world and on board exams. Okay, so how is cow's milk protein allergy and eosinophilic esophagitis different and similar? Well, the differences are the location of the GI tract. Okay, so generally, as the name implies, eosinophilic esophagitis is going to be limited to the esophagus versus a cow's milk protein allergy can affect the stomach. It can affect the small bowel, or as we've discussed, it can affect the large bowel, okay? Symptom-wise, it's going to be a, probably a bit different. Dysphagia is the most common symptom that we hear from eosinophilic esophagitis, and that is defined as after swallowing, the food gets stuck on the way down, okay? That's what I mean by dysphagia. Dysphagia can be a lot of different phases. It can be oral phase, oral pharyngeal phase, esophageal phase. We're talking about esophageal phase dysphagia. So food getting stuck after the swallow has successfully occurred versus our cow's milk protein allergy is more typically bleeding as we've discussed in a proctocolitis, but it also may be symptoms of reflux or feeding refusal in those younger infants if it's affecting the stomach and the small or, and or the small bowel. Okay, age of presentation, cow's milk protein allergy is usually younger. They're usually younger infants versus eosinophilic esophagitis, that's usually toddlers and above. Not to say that you can't find it in an infant, but it's pretty rare for us to find it because it's a diagnosis that we find on biopsies. Um, and we don't typically have to biopsy infants less than, in infants less than one year of age because we can use these hypoallergenic formulas or do the elimination diets in the moms that are gonna treat EOE. And so that saves them from the risk um, that, that is involved with um, going through a scope. Okay, how are they similar though? There are similarities. They're both allergic reactions. They both are due to an exposure to an allergen over time and both show eosinophilic infiltration on biopsies. Okay, so both, um, both have the, the same treatment and that is removal of that allerg allergen. It is a dietary change, just like we've been talking about with cow's milk protein allergy. So eosinophilic enteropathy, so eosinophils are present throughout the GI tract, but they are not supposed to be in the esophagus. They're just not. And they are characterized by increased numbers of eosinophils within the GI tract mucosa, as a, a, when we're talking about these in general. And it is an example of mixed mediation allergy. So not only an IgE component, but a non-IgE component. And that's the reason it's always not going to be the right answer. And that's the reason I've said you need to assume if you've got a GI manifestation that there's a non-IGE component there. So you're not necessarily, you're not going to be able to just go get allergy tested for this. And you, and you're going to want to, you're going to want to limit the soy um, exposure as well. So you're beginning, I hope, I think you're probably beginning to see and understand as we keep this distinction of what type of allergen it is and realizing that non-IGE component, it's just not as simple as going to the allergist and getting tested, all right? So the most common form of eosinophilic associated gastrointestinal disorders is eosinophilic esophagitis, okay? It is seen in all ages, similar presentation to gastroesophageal reflux disease. I've just mentioned that. Invariably, these children will be misdiagnosed with gastroesophageal reflux disease before they end up coming to the gastroenterologist. We scope them, get the biopsies that are required to make this diagnosis. Two thirds of these infants have a personal or family history of asthma, eczema, or allergic rhinitis. And 
And this is why I'm amazed at how long it takes before I, how long it takes before I see these patients that they've just lived with this. Like food getting stuck and having to wash it down or throw it up for months and months and months and months. They just live with it, it's fine. It's, you don't wanna know why? Because their mama or their daddy has the same symptoms because it really runs in families. So they just think that's the way our family is and it's no big deal. And then they have an event where it's alarming. They can't get it to come up or go down and it gets scary. That's when they get referred to us um, most often or I may meet them, I may meet them after hours um, where they come to the emergency room because they're in such distress and that food bolus is stuck. And so we're going to the OR in the middle of the night to take this, this, this food impaction out of their esophagus. That's not what we want for our patients. That's not the way I want to meet them. So if you've got a fan, if you've got a symptom in your practice where they're telling you food is getting stuck on the way down, get an upper GI to make sure there's not an anatomical dip, uh, uh, abnormality, anatomical abnormality, and refer them to the pediatric gastroenterologist at the, at the same time. They need to be scoped, all right? The diagnosis, I've said it a couple of times now, it is by endoscopy with esophageal biopsy. That's required in order to make that diagnosis. Infiltration of eosinophils within that esophageal mucosa is what is seen. Um, think about this diagnosis. If you've got GERD symptoms refractory to normal medical therapy, it's just not getting better despite what you do typically for reflux, they may have eosinophilic esophagitis going on. Um, greater than 65% of cases appear in childhood. This is not a disease of adulthood. Yes, we see it in adults, but it pro those, those, the majority of those adults with this, they had symptoms that started in their childhood. So it's your and my job to, to find them and get them treated so they don't develop the really intense um, sequelae such as esophageal stricturing that can happen and be seen later in life where this has not been treated appropriately. Okay, symptoms in infants for EOE, feeding refusal, failure to thrive, regurgitation, and vomiting. Sounds like reflux, doesn't it? In children, dysphagia, vomiting, abdominal pain, heartburn. Some of those symptoms sound like reflux, don't they? And in adults and adolescents, dysphagia, food impaction, we talked about that, heartburn and reflux. So you, when you look at these symptoms, regardless of age, you begin to understand why often these children will, or children and adults will be diagnosed with um, gastroesophageal reflux. And that's fine, but if they're not responding in the typical fashion, think about EOE. But if you've got, EOS, you've got dysphagia in your history, send them to see us send them to see us and get an upper GI that they can get between your referral and when we see them. So we know that there's not anything anatomically going on or if there is, we know that going into our scope exam. Okay, so we get our biopsies. What are the pathologists seeing? All right, these are all examples of biopsies from the esophagus and I, want, and, and I don't expect you to be pathologists, um, but what I want you to notice is where you see the red cells, each of those red cells are eosinophils. What our pathologists are doing is they are counting the number of eosinophils per high powered field. And to meet the criteria to diagnose a patient with eosinophilic esophagitis, they need to have greater than 15 eosinophils per high powered field. Greater than 15, one five eosinophils per high powered field. Each of these slides is an example of that. So in the upper left in box A, look at that conglomeration, that aggregate of, of all those red cells that are on the surface of that mucosa, that's an eosinophilic abscess. Okay, and I'm gonna show you a picture of that in a moment, what, what that looks like. So that's an eosinophilic abscess. That's just a, a ton of, of white blood cells on the surface. And so it, it's pus is what it is. All right, uh, con uh, that conglomeration of inflammatory cells in an abscess on the surface. To the upper right, you'll see on that surface, you'll see along the top, and then a few in the deeper layers in box B, you'll see those, that, that host of infiltration of eosinophils there. Um, and then you can appreciate those in box C and D as well. 
um, at closer and farther perspective under the microscope. So that's what the, that's what the um, pathologists are looking for. So as I mentioned, eosinophil count, eosinophil count must be greater than 15 for high powered field. The biopsies after six to eight weeks of twice daily acid suppression, you may have seen this in the past where there was the idea of proton pump inhibitor responsive EOE. Honestly, guys, that's fallen by the wayside. I keep this bullet in here to have the opportunity to say that idea has fallen by the wayside. It's now not really the recommendation of the um, North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition to, to do this um, PPI therapy um, for EOE, if you know that they have that, um, because you've got to remove the allergen. And yes, we might use PPI at the beginning to help get their symptoms under control faster, but that's not the long-term therapy. It's removal of that allergen from their diet is the long-term therapy. And biopsies do need to be obtained for great, from greater than or equal to five esophageal sites. Okay, some of the pathogenesis, not to get bagged down on it, but it's driven by Th2 cytokine pathways and interleukin-5 and interleukin-13. Those are inflammatory cytokines that are part of the, part of the immune, your immune system and my immune system. Um, that lead to this infiltration of the eosinophils within the GI tract. You don't need to get bogged down on that. Okay, and so some of you all are eating lunch, so I've got to provide some pictures that are in, um, that go along with that, right? So um, in box A, here's that food bolus. Okay, here's the food bolus that I might meet in the middle of the night because they can't get it to go up or down. So often that's with meats. It's often with chicken, and so am I going to go to the OR with my scope and just push this bolus downstream? Seems like that'd be the easiest thing to do. Well, I really can't because I don't know that they have a diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis and they may have a stricture, anatomical stricture on the other side of that bolus. And if I just go pushing that bolus downstream, I could perforate their esophagus. And that is the last thing that you want to do. You perforate the esophagus. It's probably never going to be quite the same again. So that's the last thing I want to do. So what do I do with this? Through my scope, I am putting tools to pick at this and debulk this. And so there I am in the middle of the night, picking chicken. Pick, 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 pick. It's real glamorous. It's real glamorous, folks. I mean, it, it is monotony and I'm getting to do it. I mean, the people in the room with me are just, you know, so, but that's what you got to do. You've got to debulk this enough that it's finally small enough to go downstream. But if I meet these parents in the, and this patient in, in the emergency room, I'm going to tell them after I get this bolus out of the way, I'm doing biopsies because they probably have eosinophilic esophagitis. On the right-hand side at the top in box B, see those linear stria going off in the distance? That corrugation, that linear furrowing is what we call that. Very characteristic in um, patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. Doesn't have to be, but we see that not infrequently. Box C, there's those abscesses I was talking about. We looked at those histologic slides where that aggregate of eosinophils and that pus on the surface that's what this is. And we'll biopsy this. And you've already seen what the pathologists are seeing. And then on box D on the bottom right, see the rings? That's called tracheolization of the esophagus. Your esophagus shouldn't have rings. It's a smooth tube. Okay. And that's what it should be. So if you see this tracheolization going on the esophagus, that's characteristic. In terms of what we normally see with the eosinophilic esophagitis, it usually looks normal to the naked eye. The second most common is box B. The third most common, box C. And then it's pretty rare for us to see the tracheolization. We might, but it's pretty rare. And hopefully, but unfortunately, sometimes we're seeing box A, and that's usually in the middle of the night. All right. So this is what we're seeing on scope. Okay. So two components of management of EOE. One is a nutritional component, and two is a pharmacologic component. All right. So nutritional management. Okay, on the, on the left-hand side, six food elimination. So the eliminate, strict elimination at the beginning of milk, eggs, nuts, and tree nuts, fish and shellfish, wheat, and corn. Okay, 
that's daunting. I get that. But it, they're not allergic to all of these. But we know statistically, what have we said? I can't just go and send them for allergy testing to tell me which of these foods are non-IgE mediated. So we're eliminating all six, if, you, if we're being transparent, eight of foods at the beginning. And we're going to go over we're going to go over the um, some new, some pharmacologic things that we do as well, and that combination they get better, they just get better. And then once they're better from a symptom standpoint, we start reintroducing these foods no faster than one food every two months. Why do we wait two months? Non IgE mediated delayed hypersensitivity. We've got to give that patients body time to develop those symptoms again. And so we're go it's methodical. If they cheat, all bets are off. But if they follow it and we're going through with them in a very methodical fashion, we will work our way back and they will only have one, maybe two of these foods that's really causing the problem. We've already talked about allergy testing at the bottom of that branch of the algorithm. So I'm not going to go into that. What about amino acid based diet an elemental formula as a milk source? Well, milk we know statistically, milk is the number dairy is the number one cause the number one cause um, allergen for eosinophilic esophagitis. So if you're taking that away, you're taking away a source of macro and micronutrients. So you're wanting to replace that with something that is balanced from a macro and micronutrient standpoint that is hypoallergenic. So remember, we've already talked about um, we already talked about those products that are amino acid based that are hypoallergenic they are going to be more balanced from a macro and micronutrient standpoint than going out and doing where parents will go out and do rice milk or, um, or coconut milk. Look at the ingredient label on those. They're mostly water and they do not have the macro and micronutrients that say dairy would have in our children's diets um, on a regular basis. So be, be sure to give the parents that information that they, that they, that they can go on a product that does have the micro and macronutrients from a health standpoint in a hypoallergenic formula. And we've already gone over those today. So you make that choice for them, but you've got to give them that information or they're not going to go out and get this product, that, those healthy products as a replacement for dairy in their diet. Okay. So when should the eliminated food be reintroduced in house? So if you ask five different gastroenterologists, you might get five different answers because there's no consensus statement yet. And once symptoms are resolved, I've already shared with you, I reintroduce one eliminated food no faster than every two to three months because it's a delayed hypersensitivity. We have to assume that there's a non-IGE component and we've got to give that patient's body time to develop symptoms again after that reintroduction before we go on to the next food. You go too quickly, it gets really, really confusing if the symptoms return. Okay. So that's the dietary part of it. What about the pharmacologic management? So at the beginning, when I initially make that diagnosis and get that diagnosis back from the um, pathologist, we are going to use some steroids for six to eight weeks. Um, and I will use a proton pump inhibitor for about three months. So let's start with the steroid idea. It's very rare to have to use sy uh, systemic steroids. So prednisone, that's very, very rare. I only had to do that maybe a couple of times uh, in my career. But the topical idea we use all the time for this. And it's a, beautiful, um, it's a beautiful way to use topical steroids and it's really effective. What we will do is we will use Pulmacort respules and they'll open that respule, mix it with about five packets of Splenda. So it is a sweet slurry. And then they will take that and it will coat the esophagus and decrease that inflammation but that's only for about six to eight weeks. So we're decreasing that inflammation quickly. So their symptoms are resolving quickly. Um, you may see fluticasone use. So puff and swallow. In my experience, I think that the Pulmacort works better. It's a better application to the esophagus. The proton pump inhibitor simply being used for three months to help take the acid out of the mix. So the esophagus heals faster and then they can come off of the proton pump inhibitors. All right. And I think that I have gone over all that because I do want to get to some Q&A, guys. Okay, if I find a stricture, I'm not going to dilate it. I'm going to treat them the way we've talked about. And I have two children in my practice that they had strictures. I've never had to dilate them. And that's great because it decreases their chance for perforation during that esophageal dilatation part of a scope. So it, the family is more than happy to wait on the, on the dilatation. 
and it, I have found real success by treating them effectively. So we've already talked about when to refer. If you've got dysphagia or you've got a patient that's non-responsive to your typical, um, typical treatment of reflux, send them our way. Okay, the role, of, uh, the role of allergy testing, Cincinnati and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, they did the same study. They looked at delayed hypersensitivity patch testing. Philadelphia said you could use that in order to get your diagnosis. Cincinnati said you couldn't. And most allergies don't do, allergists don't do delayed hypersensitivity patch testing anyway. And that's the reason I've really underscored to you that that's not going to be the easy out to get your diagnosis or to find your allergies. And it often will just simply confuse families because all that's being looked at is the IgE mediated. So if we've got, if we've got blood and mucus in the stool, atopic dermatitis, eosinophilic um, gastroenteropathies, short bowel syndrome, we're gonna use our casein hydrolysate formula. And when are we gonna go to our elemental amino acid-based formula? Certainly if you've got improved but continued other signs and symptoms of that cow's milk soy protein allergy, um, eosinophilic esophagitis. Certainly we're going to use these products, these, these hypoallergenic products, elemental products for short bowel syndrome and other regions, but uh, you know, our, our, our focus today has certainly been on allergy and we absolutely use these products and sometimes need to go to the top of the pyramid. Okay, so we've talked about average food reactions, how that can include food intolerance and food allergy. Dietary management is the key. We've talked about cow's milk soy protein allergy. We've talked about how dietary management is the key. And we've talked about eosinophilic esophagitis. And we've talked about how we do use pharmacologic management at the beginning of treatment, but ultimately dietary management is the key. And what I like about all of these is really for the long term, we're not prescribing. We're not using medications to treat these diagnoses. It's dietary management. And, and I think that that's a great thing. And with um, the formulas that we've talked about today, if that baby is not on infant formula or that older child needs a hypoallergenic formula, they're out there now. They're out there to serve and to be tools in our toolbox to manage the dietary manifestations of these, di of these GI um, diagnoses and the clinical presentations that go along with that. Okay, nutrition's the focus. Thank you all very much. I want, to, uh, I want to open the floor to um, any questions that you may have. All right, thanks, John. Very entertaining presentation. And um, a couple questions for you. So first, if someone is still having silent reflux on a PPI, is the next step diet change? So it, it wouldn't be wrong to make a dietary change. So there when I think about a silent refluxer, I think about that, I'm going to say baby, who um, you're just not seeing reflux that come up into the oropharynx. They're having symptoms that could be reflux. They may not be reflux. If you've got that infant like that, I think it's totally reasonable to treat that as if they have upper GI cow's milk protein allergy and to do strict elimination of dairy and soy from their diet if, it's, if mom's breastfeeding or to go to a hypoallergenic formula um, to see what kind of impact that makes before they're referring them to the pediatric gastroenterologist. I think that is absolutely reasonable if they're not responding to that typical GERD therapy. Okay. And then uh, when the baby is allowed to have cow's milk and soy protein reintroduced back into their diet at nine months of age, uh -huh. does it need to be a gradual re reintroduction? Okay, that's a great question. Does it need to be a gradual thing? Okay, I get this question a lot. And um, I, I see folks gradually introduce dairy and soy uh, back into the diet. Remember, we're talking about an allergic process. And if they have outgrown it, they have outgrown it. So it does not need to be a gradual reintroduction. Simply say, with that reintroduction, if the symptoms come back, then we're going to go off of it for two more months allow that healing process to occur, and then wait a little bit before we re-challenge. So it, there's not a need to gradually go back into it. They've either outgrown it or they haven't. Okay. Good question. Last question. If a breastfeeding mom needs to go on an elimination diet for cow's milk protein allergy, mm -hmm. should they go to a hypoallergenic formula for a few days before returning to breast milk to allow for protein washout 
or can they continue on breast milk? Okay, that's a really good question as well. Um, what, ask two gastroenterologists, you might get two different answers, but here's, here's my goal in the process. The question comes from the standpoint of that mom's taking dairy and soy, and then they come to see you or me and we say, we've got, you gotta eliminate dairy and soy. There is a washout period that takes place. And I am more invested in an otherwise healthy looking infant. I'm more invested in that baby staying on the breast. And so I allow that mom to start her elimination diet, but to continue breastfeeding through that and allow that washout period to occur. Because I don't want them to go on a hypoallergenic formula and then that, mom, that baby make that transition and be frustrated going back to the breast or, or that mom getting um, leaving the idea of breastfeeding. I just don't want that to happen. So I, I allow babies to stay on the breast during that washout period, knowing that it takes about, it takes about seven to 10 days for, that, for those proteins to wash completely out of the breast milk. But I would rather them stay on that small exposure for seven to 10 days than take the risk of that baby stopping breastfeeding. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good answers, John. And so thank you for the great presentation.